Hello, and welcome to Playing With Pyre. I'm ZK, your host for this week's episode of the fan podcast of Immortal Gates of Pyre. With me is the uh, usual guests, Dominic and Zard. Hi. How you Hello. doing, Dom? How you doing, Dom? I'm okay. I'm... <laughs> Yeah, I'm okay. That's that's all I'm I'm willing to talk about publicly. <laughs> good enough. Zard, how about you? I'm surviving. That's good. <laughs> that's the <Dust> essential. <laughs> that's the essential, and that's all we truly want out of this. Uh, yeah, surviving. <laughs> oh, surviving, thriving. I'm sure. I'm sure that's our goal with Immortal. At least the Immortal is still in a game state. So, in today's episode, the plan is we're still going to talk about uh, the tournament. As usual, we're going to talk about the results and all that. Then we're going to move into discussing a bit about the Giant Grand Games video, which we discussed last time, but there were a lot of reactions about it. So I thought we'd mm -hmm. react on the reactions, because wh who wouldn't want to do that? Because we're a bunch of nerds and Recursion is our main game. <laughs> <laughs> I won't deny that. I like Recursion as much as the next person. But before we get started, I'd like to uh, play like a small... Well, not really a game, just a, just a small fun fact for whoever's watching on YouTube or on Twitch. So I want each of you to give me one fun lore fact from Immortal, since this this podcast is more about uh, the gameplay aspects of, the, of it or whatever surrounds it, the meta of the game. Uh, let's talk a bit about the game within the game. So tell me your favorite info, well, tell me one tidbit of lore that you really appreciate, the Zard. Let's start with Zard, because he always has a bunch of them. Let me see... Little tid, little tidbit. There are sphinxes on Zur. I don't know what those are. <laughs> there is also it who speaks on Zur. Not that I know what that is either, but I just know names and they sound heckin' cool. Wait, you mean this entire game is for, is Dylan a, making the log of his home world? <laughs> Sounds goodbye, <laughs> <I> man. <laughs> Sounds fun at the very least. <laughs> Dom, do you have a fun fact that rivals Zard's? I guess the fun fact that I I find constantly interesting is Jor is kind of a weird mishmash, and it's just interesting the way people the way it gets described. Like it's constant, like all of the things, like democratic juntas, like that is not how governments work. But more power to you. <laughs> It reminds me of like it reminds me of like English. How English like took a whole bunch of languages and smushed them together. Oh yeah, we were talking about that earlier today. Yeah. 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 That was... We were talking about that earlier today. It was like, well, okay, well, it's English, the country where you take a bunch of them and you smash them together. <laughs> no, it's it's where, it's where old it's where Dutch, and French, oh, Dutch and then Latin and then eventually French all kind of came together, and then took put on a trench coat. And called themselves a language. <laughs> There's Perfect. a lot more influences, I'm sure, than that. But yeah, I guess that's a Those good base for it. Well, Frisian, not so much Dutch, but Frisian's a like yeah. a, it's a language spoken in the West Netherlands. So yeah. It's... And then on top yeah. of that, you have a hat of a lot of different stuff that just adds in and all. Oh yeah, a lot of loan words coming in there, but the core of it is a mix of of Old High German, French, and Latin. And French being Latin as well as origin, so. Yeah, I know, but it's like Latin. Yeah, it's mostly Rome French. Conquered England, independent of France conquering England. Oh, oh wow! Okay, that's interesting. So they had like yeah, Latin like a, roots. A, millennia, a millennia prior, but yeah. So Latin roots and then French roots on top of it. Okay, that's fun. Yep. And I'm wondering how that changes up on the on the portal, however that uh, happened on shale. And my favorite fact is just that humans, while they are there, they probably don't originate from that system, so we don't know where they originate from. So that's interesting. I don't know if they come from Earth or that Earth exists in this dimension, world, whatever, if they come from another dimension. Mm -hmm. So yeah, have no clue where humans come from. Who knows? They've been here for 10,000 years at least. Right, Zard? Yep. Sounds about accurate. Or is, and like the answer to that question that we've gotten from Dylan is a giant smiley face. So <laughs> multiple times. Along with a good question. So yeah, we've gotten that a few I times mean, already. Unless it's like humanity from earth tell somehow managed to get their way to the pyre system through a gate or something maybe like a one-way thing opened up and then some walked through and then founded a home and who knows when that happened because for all we know the whole magic metaphysics thing of the pyre system might cause greater space-time curvature so time might flow slower there so ten thousand years could have been oh wait that's the opposite way well either way <laughs> 
Either way, way. Because we will find <laughs> out one of these years. So, yeah, I know there's also a lot of humans, and yeah, because because like in different games, humans aren't necessarily the swarmy ones, but it seems like Jorah's kind of swarmy, so are humans like reproducing like crazy and they can swarm because angels live thousands yeah, of I, years. I'd put it in that they're very good at making pile drivers. Yeah, no, there you go. <laughs> Well, in any case, that was the lore of the week. So hopefully you enjoyed this. We'll, we'll probably do it. Let's, let's go. Lore of the week is bad. No, yes, no. Zard's pile driver comment is just, it's a subtle, really subtle, dirty joke. That's all. I have, I, that went over my head. <laughs> <laughs> I love when it goes over everyone's head except one person. But we're, <laughs> let's not go into details then. Uh, if you want more details, join the Discord of Immortal Gates of Fire and no. ask Dom directly <laughs> for that. And yeah, Dom probably can't put it because it's still PG, so, you know. I'll, I'll petition for an NSFW channel just to explain why that joke is dirty. sounds no. to me like a subtle, dirty joke. No. And only that. <laughs> and then the channel will be closed after that point in archive. No. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> Usually we would talk about the patch notes, but all we know about patch notes is that there's a big one coming. It's been hinted at uh, frequently that we're about to have some major changes, but it's all spoiler territory. And if you want more details, you have to show up on the py pirate side chat on Friday. It really there's too many pirate puns. I get why they why they say it's bad. Any case, feel free to join on Friday at twelve EST, six uh, Europe time, and nine. Wait, no, I'm completely wrong. Games Twitch channel, by the way, not here. Yeah, Sunspur Games Twitch channel at 3.30 EST, 9.30 Europe time, and 12.30 PST. So feel free to join that one where they're going to make a big announcement of Jack Attack being the invited guest or community manager or one oh. of them with CMUS. Wait, oh. oh. Yeah. Oh, I guess I should actually watch. Oh, yeah. I the... often watch those after the fact because it's like I'm, I'm working. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get that. I mean, I, my, my work day is ending, so I'm good. But yeah, apparently yeah, there's going to be... fine, but yeah. it's 12.30 for me, so it's like... Lunchtime. Eh. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, big announcements coming in, so uh, feel free to watch that one. Apparently lots of balance changes on top of... Well, we don't really know what else, but at least some, some balance tidbits at yeah. Donovan and whoever dropped here and there. And yeah. Oh yeah, we saw a bunch of those. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. They're going to add Walter everywhere. And on that note... Let's go straight to the oh, tournament. God, it's April 1st next week. They might. They actually might, yeah. <laughs> I ex I kind of expect that, especially with Simus being who he is. But yeah, let's drop into the tournament. So I'll just show, show the challenge of the tournament. So the challenge. This week we had... Uh, uh, me and Dom weren't, uh, part weren't uh, casting, so we decided to participate. We got 2-1, so we won a game. I'm quite we happy did. about we, that. We got a game. We got a game. Mostly thanks to ZK shot calling, honestly. <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not going to take credit for that. All right, we still won. You had you said a good macro this time, at least. We were able to... Uh, oh, let, let's go over the games a bit. Forever wants to watch the tournament. I'm just going to give a quick feedback on what it is. The first game, uh, me and Dom overcommitted against Yeti and Noel, and then they just, you know, snowballed from there. We overcommitted to I a tried pillar. doing a two-base, two-altar <laughs> timing. That was too fast. Yeah. Yeah, well, it happens. Uh, second game, we went for a timing while uh, Yeti was going for uh, Frums. Frums are great, except when you want to kill them directly. So we just went for the good old strategy of, oh, he has Frums to harass. That means he has no units. That's just a game. And it worked. Third game, went a bit longer game. We went a lot of macro while me and Dom had a bit of the map control advantage. It ended up being in Yeti is now well's uh, favor because they went for tech heavy build and just had a huge, super strong Croft yeah. double army. Yeah. That and yes, you lost some units somewhere on the map. Yep. We didn't go air. <laughs> exactly. So, Yeti and Noel move on to the semifinals. Semifinals. Um, Zard, you were you observing them all. Do you want to go for this one? or? Uh, oh, yeah. See, I don't think I got to observe all of them. That's, okay, actually, I, I actually observed Pigeon Rent for the Santa Claus versus Yeti and Noel. Let's just go quick uh, quick feedback. Now, well, uh, Pigeon and Santa 1-2-0, good macro. Uh, Santa was being Santa and just basically killed them with harass, as Santa does. Uh, yeah, and then they just basically went straight up from, you know, having Dervish in the middle line, uh, Alloy Alliance the whole game, or or uh, Deceptor just doing a lot of damage. That was basically it for two games. Yet and Noel really couldn't get their economy to the level of their opponents and ended up losing. On the other side of the bracket, uh, here we go, Drago and Iron Mirror retool the Doctor and Altafin. Uh, I don't think anyone saw that one, so I can't really comment. And the semifinals, I'll let Zard go over that one as he was uh, observing it. 
So two. Let me think. I I'm actually struggling to remember a bit because like I was sleep deprived at the time. So <laughs> okay, well <laughs> I'll know, go like, for it then. <laughs> zombie doing it while you're you know, like yeah. yeah. Yeah, but, don't be a zombie. Uh, from what I remember, Drago and Iremir attempted some cheese. Oh, yeah. And unfortunately, it did not work out for them. Actually, and... actually, I think it worked out. Like, like that's something we see a lot of it in Immortal. Like, they did some decent damage. No, oh, can, I, can I get to it? Like, they actually did some decent damage on those pushes. Uh, but then they didn't expand behind it, which caused them to just lose the longer game. Because I'm pretty sure they did a lot of damage. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, and then the I think the second game there's something about an enormous pile of sentinels <laughs> shut down drums and then a ground army absolutely wrecked things. I can't remember if that was finals or if that was um Yeah, that was still that second game with the Frums. Well the Frums were on Leon's side actually and Leon did a good job with those. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Leon was good. Yeah, Leon. Leon's a player actually that we hadn't seen in a while. He used to participate in maybe September or something or in December. He used to do some two v twos of Magical back then, and yeah, he played pretty well. But wasn't able. To, he played pretty well. And yeah, obviously they they made it at least past this round into the finals. And Dom, I'll let you take over for the finals, just so uh, if you remember them between Pigeon was... Santa against Magical Leon. Do you remember or not really? I do remember that, like, the first game, I remember it was kind of back and forth, but there was an advantage that Magical and Leon got early on that never really lost. I don't remember the, I can't remember the exact details, but I do remember that it was like, oh, they just couldn't really keep, or rather, Santa and Pigeon just couldn't really keep pushing what they had. And then the second game, was, and the, yeah, a bunch of harassment was going on too, yeah. that's right. A lot of harassment coming in so it just kept sand and pigeon wrench from really building up yeah and then game two was just they got smashed <laughs> it was the it was the last pillar rush we shall ever see yep so game two oh, was okay, just the cheese. last hallowed ground pillar rush we might still see pillar rushes but they're not gonna have hallowed ground around it that's changing well well that's still a spoiler for forever doesn't know about balance change but we did hear some uh some news about like Dom just discord said. you'll know yeah, exactly. Some news like that that there might be some hallowed ground leaving with the with the pillar, or it might be delayed. We don't know if it's next patch as well, so that might be a bit later. We don't know exactly what's coming. Uh, yeah, but yeah, the uh, logic behind it is just that the ability to instantly die if you're out of position because of the sudden hallowed ground is not really fun design. So therefore, we get rid of it, right? So. That's, that's the logic. It'll come eventually. <laughs> Basically. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we see here, like, in the video, there was pretty much the big final... A, a big push that just secured them a big map advantage uh, with their army and, yeah, taking out both their opponents third. Really strong, and then they just kept on going for the victory. And in the final game, it was, as you said, it was just a big cheese, a big pile of Gouda that yep. did its job. It was pretty Gouda yeah, cheese, for took, sure. Took Took a big wheel of cheese and just mashed into their opponent's face for a while. We gotta say, like, that's something I kind of appreciate of the current state of Immortal, where you have, like, we do have the cheese, but we also have, like, the macro play. We have, we have variants, right? It's not, uh, and the cheese, like, we saw in the first game where, Dra well, where, I, where Drago and Iron Mirror were trying to cheese uh, Magical and Leon, where they did some damage, but then they didn't expand behind it, lost because of it. So it's a nice dynamic, at least, in my opinion. Turns out you need bases because it's hard to fund an army with no money. Yeah. Although you do have a lot of economy from that uh, initial base as well. Uh, but yeah, so that was the tournament. Just a quick recap for whoever doesn't have the time to watch the whole tournament. If you do want to watch it, go watch it on Cespier Games. Uh, there's also going to be some more games that are going to appear on my YouTube channel, which uh, is also going to be for playing with Pyre. I'll post it on the Discord of Immortal. We're going to at least show off the games and also do some a bit of casting with Nawel. So that was fun for our, on our side. And yeah, so that was it for the tournament. Magico, another win, another finals, and another win. He he had a bit of a bump uh, last week where he didn't actually win in the finals. So it's good to see him back on top. Sorry, I'm busy with cat. Oh, that's good. Well, can we see the cat? Yeah, exactly. Where's the cat tax? 
that time. Oh, I like the green screen design. <laughs> cat tax. Actually, I should change change screen so we can see the cat tax better. Nope, it's not it. <laughs> cat. Aw. Yep. Meow. She's the best kitty. Yeah. Meow. In case, I think now we're ready to go back to uh, to the show. Dom, uh, the cat had its uh, scritches. The cat is happy, I hope. Yes. Good. That's what yes. the, all cats deserve to the be happy. The cat will cease to intentionally cause problems. Only unintentional ones now, right? <laughs> it makes no prom he makes no promises. Makes no promises. So, next part, we're going to go back of, uh, of a video we covered last week because it's been doing the tour of all the strategy game for us, all the real-time strategies and battle battle strategy like Immortal is. So let's go over back to the next major RTS so fail. This is why. So what is this video? It's a Giant Grand Games, a a, a content creator who mostly makes game, who mostly makes a casual level videos, basically. So a lot of campaign play, a lot of arcade play. And he explains why he thinks the next art, art major RTS will fail. This is why. To be fair, that title is a bit clickbaity, which we are all prone to. Uh, the reason, it's most an explanation of what the next RTS needs to succeed. Uh, he made a decent list of it, where you need a good engine. Uh, you need some, a really some good engine, meaning the unit's moving well, you can traverse the, the, the map well and all that. Uh, second one, needing a good spectacle, just so it looks nice and all that. And finally, some development. And he believes you need some development tools, so user-created content is a big, big thing for him. Now, after that, we did have, uh, in the following week, of course, we were the first to review it because we were just that quick. It followed up with uh, with, with uh, people covering it, so some members of community. So we had uh, Loco, uh, Winter, and BeastieQD, so all prominent StarCraft II content creators. And that gave their opinions on it. I'm not sure if you guys had a chance to watch it, uh, but yeah, just to go over it quickly, Local and Winter, uh, Local and Winter generally agree with the sentiment of yeah, casual games are pretty good. We have a large demographic, uh, like like StarCraft, like StarCraft Two has a large demographic. It's mostly casual though, and we need to cater to the casuals to really make to succeed in the next game. Besides that, you do need a good engine, you need a good spectacle, and then the development tools really allow the game to continue for a long time. Uh, I think your impressions were similar to that. What do you guys? Uh, what about you, yeah, Dom? No, yeah. I generally think that I generally think that that is pretty accurate. The main thing I could tell from the main thing I could tell from the BCQD one was basically it. I didn't really agree with that mainly because it felt like yes, okay, budgets are important, but everything that Grant talked about was choices. Like engine isn't so much like yeah, it it's a little bit difficult to develop an engine that's responsive, but it's. The thing is, a lot of the examples given, things like Iron Harvest or thing, or really a lot of more recent games, have tended to veer towards realism over responsiveness. The idea of like having this sense of like a real meaty army that takes a while to turn and do stuff because it's a real, it's a bunch of real vehicles and real people moving around in the real war zone, and it's like, yeah, that doesn't really work. And that again, that's a choice. That's not a technical consideration necessarily. That's just if you're if you're deciding to make a game where you're focusing primarily on realism it is going to be hard to control which does not feel good but that's a choice to be fair i hadn't uh, done the resume of uh beastie cuties video quite yet uh but yeah as dom said a lot of it is mostly just uh devs so basically beastie cutie was unhappy because as a part of the argument from Giant Gregus is the lack of competency from devs and BCQD didn't appreciate that. Says devs are very competent; they just don't have the funds in general. And that, yeah, I, think that was, I didn't get that from Grant's video at all. I didn't. Uh, no, no, the devs no. Were yeah, no. Made to be incompetent. I think that it was just a matter of prioritizing. The devs are focused again. Priority. Devs are focusing on the wrong things. That's, yeah. That seems that's the impression I got. Yeah, no, possibly. But I mean, everyone has different impressions, right? Beastie just saw it's like, oh my god, he's saying the devs, uh, the devs chose not to do it well. It's like no. They did kind of choose not to do it. Well, could have they have done it if they had prioritized? It's a, it's a loaded question. Any well, they chose to do it in a way that was, that created a better sense of immersion. 
it's just not necessarily the most the best way of doing it. Yeah, it's a choice. Okay. Any thoughts on your side, Zard? Uh, in terms of um, in terms of the engine, it's like it's it's two things. Like I think there's a middle ground to be had here, whereas like. Giant Grand Games is taking one side of an issue and then BCQD is taking the other side of an issue. When I think that the issue is like taking just one side versus the other, I think you end up losing out on a lot of nuance, right, to the issue. Like on one side, like actually on both sides, they're both right in their own way. Like yeah. developers definitely require more funding on the other hand like there there's also something we said for maybe devs are somewhat stuck in the past right like i agree because if you look at the way creativity works it's often taking previous ideas and then iterating on them in a way that like they include something new and iterating can iterating as a process is often taking old things and putting them together and scrambling them around in order to create new ideas and to get a feel for exactly what you're doing, right? Yeah. So as a result of the fact that RTS has just not had a lot of iteration, that means that devs can, just creatively speaking, end up stuck in the past regardless of the funds that they have. And mm -hmm. so that begs the question with like Immortal Gates of Fire and with Age of Empires 4 um, and with um, Frost Giants game, what exactly are the new things that are going to be done here in order to, with the fact that previous stuff has been stuck in the past such that they can move forward, right? And so you kind of yeah. need a combination of both recognizing that moving forward needs to happen and recognizing that funds need to happen in order to actually get somewhere productive rather than just defending one side versus the other yeah although actually one thing about your point there i i i really agree on the iteration thing absolutely the one thing that i think is worth noting is that i actually don't agree that devs are stuck in the past what i think it is actually more is that iteration is a gradual process but right. in part because of the fact that there hasn't been a lot of iteration and so not a lot of basically there isn't really a library of rts to draw from from a yeah. design vocabulary perspective especially the recent ones especially, especially in the recent, recent ones. ones yeah especially for the last 10 years and so the lot so there's not a lot of rts vocabulary to draw from that's anywhere recent and also there's kind of always been a bit of a and like the word antagonism towards starcraft in yeah. general and craft like rts yeah. in general yeah. that prompts a lot of developers or at least I don't know if it prompts the developers, but it certainly prompts the development process to produce games that are quite experimental in how they do things. So you I know. don't think, I, for instance, the response to this thing in particular, I don't think that is done out of incompetence. I think that's done specifically because of the fact that they're trying to be different and they're trying to throw stuff at the wall and see if it sticks, but there's not a lot of time that that happens. Like, it's yeah. not happening enough to find what works. Because yeah. I can see why you would do that. Like, Honestly, the response in this thing, I, I harp on this a lot because I think it's the most important priority question rather than just a funds question, is that there's there's a tendency to look at StarCraft as bad because it's fast. And the thing with StarCraft is that it's fast in part because of the fact that it is so responsive. The response in this enables the speed. So a lot so but it also creates this unrealistic approach because it's very arcadey. So for a lot of games that are trying to be different, they're going to try to be not arcadey. And an easy way to be not arcadey is to be slower, more deliberate, have more delays on things. That way you can't just quickly make a change what happens with different actions. The downside to that is that it does make the game harder to get into. It makes the game harder. It makes the game feel less responsive. It makes the game feel in a way less fun. So it's, it's different and it approach it. It it can scratch the non-arcade RTS itch, but that itch is kind of not, like... Yeah, because like you said, there's part of it that's it, iterating. It's flashing. Yeah. It's Cause, flashing. Yeah. Because part of it is iterating, right? You have StarCraft, which is... Well, StarCraft 2, which has been the RTS of the past 
12 years at this point. Yep. And then, like, the iterations that are coming out, well, it's not even iterations at the point, they're going in another well, direction it, instead, instead I'll of taking Europe. the strong it's parts of StarCraft like, 2. Feels. Yeah, it's mostly been iterations of Company of Heroes or yeah. some iterations on Total Annihilation with things like Planetary yeah. Annihilation or iterations on... I don't even really Command and Conquer anymore because Grey Goo is the last one of that. Yeah. Iterations on Total War, I guess, but that's... Yeah, that's the less that RTS, is, and that's, yeah. that's so its own thing it's entirely. Like, and then there's AoE 4, which is like the first new Age of Empires style game since Rise of Nations. True. And Rise of Nations was 2003? Yeah. Something like that ish. Yeah, something like that, yeah. Rise, yeah, it was 2003, and then Rise of Legends was 2006. And Rise of Legends was like trying to bridge the gap between an AoE style and a Starcraft style. Yeah. I will say, but, like, thinking about it a little more, is that in terms of prioritization, like, prioritization itself is a result of having limited funds because that means that you have to pick something over another and you can't have everything right good point so yeah really good point. as a result less money just means worse pathing or less content right yeah that's part of it so right. therefore people kind of have to go okay do oh. we want to make more stuff or do we want to have good pathing sort of because pathing is a solved problem yeah. Like when StarCraft 2 came out, there were papers on fluid pathing, and that, like, that's basically that state of the art. And before that, A star pathing was state of the art, and again, that was a solved problem. The only real issue was compute power, and at this point, for games that have 200, 300 units, the pathfinding it's not insignificant, but it's again, doing it efficiently is a solved problem. All right, yeah, large. yeah, the efficiency, right? Yeah, that's the other thing. Performance is, they, performance is relevant, but even then, a lot of that still solved problem for any any studio that has any RTS experience at all, or anyone on their team with RTS experience, that's a solved problem. It's like, well, it's not entirely a, it's not entirely a solved problem. It's a, it's a solved problem for, um, I, I guess what, I guess okay, the problem here is this path style path RTS. Path. You're right. When it's yeah. not going to be, when it's not a question of pathing, sorry, it's a question of responsiveness specifically. Yeah. Okay. And it, I yeah. still think responsiveness is largely a question of choice. Like, we talked about this last week, that the key is just having units move, even if the animations don't match. Mm -hmm. Like, honestly, the, the big difference between a game like StarCraft and a game like Iron Harvest is that a game like Iron Harvest, units have to turn before they can move in a given direction. Yeah. Yeah, so that makes a huge difference. Right. So I think it's like, that's that's where the fun's come in where people have to choose over going okay how are we going to make this more responsive versus how are you going to make this uh, or versus just having more content yeah because i guess it's uh, it's, it's, it's something we've seen often right you choose between realism and fun whereas starcraft yeah RKD i think that's style, choice yeah, yeah. rkd style decides to go for the fun all the way and, and ignoring a bit the realism of it in favor of making it feel good for the players and yeah yeah I mean, Seamus is right. There is fine tuning, and that is where money comes in a little bit. But I, it's still, it really is a question of what do you want. And I honestly think a lot of it just comes down to these developers are trying to make a name for themselves. They're trying to create a distinct identity in their games. And makes sense. To be feel like... trying to get away from StarCraft's overall feel. Yeah, because everyone's going to say for good reason. Yeah. They were critically panned. Every single game, sorry, every single game that came out in the heyday of RTS from like 98 2006 that had asymmetric factions and any kind of on-map resource gathering was panned for being like StarCraft. Command and Conquer General was panned for being like StarCraft. <laughs> Universe at War was panned for being like StarCraft. Oh, Although it had a lot of other issues. Rise of Legends was panned for being like StarCraft. None of these games are like StarCraft in practice, but it was Art, such yeah, all a... Three, like that, it yeah. Was, yeah, it was such... It, it attracted such vitriol that iterations on that style simply were not viable. The only reason I think that there's room now is partly because StarCraft 2 is on life support and partly because, honestly, critical reviews don't matter as much. There's a lot, like, Steam user reviews are a much bigger deal as far as where people go and see yeah. how a game is. And honestly, like, it's all about, like, it's a marketing at this point, you want to get your game out there and, like, at that point, it's getting the one big streamer to notice you and, voila, the guy yeah. with 30,000 streamers knows that you. That too, yeah. yes, because streamers are a thing now. That's yeah. another big difference from that, from back then. Yeah. That's huge. Yes, you're right. People will just follow the streamer at this point. It's like, yeah, no, you have the streamer. Yeah. There you go. Oh, man. But yeah, and then, as you said, then there's prioritization about... And if it's not prioritization, but then there's the... the 
like another, another point that was interesting to me was the you the the user content user created content and all that and why mm-hmm. would you want to do that as that's less monetizable i guess i get a lot of effort for something that in the end doesn't bring money right away because the one or not it, beastie mentioned this a lot a lot of it is just about making money the business is about making money in the end. You have to pay back your investors and they won't invest into you unless you, you have promises of way to make money. I, yeah, I still think the idea of, like, the tools themselves, Oh yeah, useful. making them available to the public is more of a an investment in having keeping eyeballs in your game for a while. But making the tools themselves is just good practice. Okay. Like, yeah, that sure. is straight up good practice. Yeah, we discussed that last week. If yeah. it comes, like, ROI on any kind of paid created content is going to be much higher if the dev time is lower. And if the tools are good, the dev time will be lower. So the upfront cost for making the tools good is going to be paid in, is going to pay dividends down the line. Yeah, okay. No, I can agree to that. Yeah, so the dev, so basically make the dev tools and making them available to the user, what that comes afterwards, because why not at this point? Because you already make Yeah, them. and yeah. at that point, the, the main thing is making sure that the user can't break anything and making sure that it's, Secure. Convenient enough for someone who doesn't have the entire company's like programming staff behind them for help. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm mostly imagining like like Dylan, who's not a programmer, who's would want probably to do it himself, right? He probably modded stuff himself in oh, StarCraft sure. and StarCraft 2. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, no, I have the tools. I can do my own scenarios. And I don't have to bother anyone instead of the scenarios and then making, making a story of like 10,000 <laughs> items or everything he has to put in there. A bit rough. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think like the the key the key thing that costs money when it comes to user generated content that does not produce an immediate ROI benefit is the making of the tools public. Mm. Because again, that's a that's a polished pass in the tools and then there's probably also going to be some kind of hosting repository or something in order to be able to upload and download mods and maps. Those things are a cost that does not have immediate ROI. That is much more of, again, investment in eyeballs and attention. That's not a direct ROI trade-off, and that can be scary. I can totally get that. Yeah. Hmm. Well, the other thing you were mentioning was that, you know, like games you want... So, so like, if you want, like, an arcade style game with a lot of, like, fast responsiveness, but then you don't want to recreate a StarCraft, even though now it's not, as you said, it's not as important. So how do you hmm. innovate on the formula? So, Zard, you can go over how, like, Immortal innovates on the formula, I guess, and then can talk about other ways you could anim- innovate on top of it, I, I suppose. Like how Immortal iterates on the... Um... Yeah, innovates. Innovates on the StarCraft style, right? Yeah. For... So, part of that is just, like, I think, I think the big part of it is reducing needless attention sinks hmm. and then making expenditure of attention like something engaging and fun and it's not like and it's basically how you go from taking an idea of expenditure of attention and taking it from a learning it from the learning curve part of the game and moving it all the way over to the mastery part of the game Whereas, like, you can play the game with a bare minimum amount of attention if you want to. Yeah, like, basic gameplay in Immortal goes something like build a Legion Hall, press Q five times, and then wait 30 seconds, and then grab your Sapari and A move them across the map. You, that, you can do that, and if that's all you want to do and that's satisfying and fun to you, go ahead, do it. Right? The learning curve is super low. Yeah. So Whereas, the... like, versus StarCraft, where you have, like, the... You want to build an army? Well, yeah, here's your five-step process. <laughs> here's the staircase. Yeah. Right? Yeah, how to learn the game. And I like the staircase. But it's still. Yeah. So, therefore, like, learning... to kill each other all the time 
and then somebody ends up on top. Oh. Oh, you want no, to repeat? I, I might have I might have muted you, Zard, by accident. Oh no. But you can hear him. Yeah, you can hear him. You can go again, Zard. But it wasn't that it wasn't that long. It was just towards the end of it that I muted you by accident. Yeah. I. What was I saying? You were talking about attention and how a game would be more about a resource management game between you and your Oh, opponent. yeah. It'd be, okay. Yeah, I, I think I got it. Um, it's about how versus, like, in the mastery part of the game, like, the attention is moved towards, okay, well, you're now interacting with your opponent, right? Yeah. That is That is the main thing that you're doing rather than spending it on remote on rope tasks. So therefore, you and your opponent are trying to kill each other all the time. You're doing something, he's doing something, you're both doing things all the time, and therefore you end up with a you you end up with more micro, more like a longer and the other interesting part about that is how you end up with a set of how to put it is how you end up with a mastery learning curve that is directly proportional to how good your opponent is right and therefore if if everybody and therefore the skill ceiling increases as the skill level of everybody else increases at the same time where everyone just starts to make better decisions etc so i kind of like that about immortal where hmm. I don't have to. I'm not getting over a learning curve, and every and everyone else is getting over like a learning curve that is necessary in order to start playing the game. And everyone is playing the game and trying to kill each other with the tools presented in the game. And I like that. No, I agree. And Dom, I guess you agree with that as well. Oh yeah, no, that that covers just about everything. The only thing that I've noticed Immortal specifically doing, which I like, is yeah. Trying to emphasize scouting. Yeah, true. Also Vanguard did it as well. It was a big, big thing with that. Was they just had free scouts, and that's huge. Yeah, no. because like honestly, one of the biggest things with Starcraft in particular that always kind of bugged me is that it felt like, and this goes back to Brood War even, it felt like you would scout like one or two things and would go, okay, well they're doing that, and then the next ten minutes of the game is you building up the counter to that in order to engage them in whatever they're whatever you're doing. So like ten minutes later. If you've built up the correct units to face them, then you can actually play the micro game of figuring out how best your units work against their units. But if you don't know what that is, you're dead. You're already dead. And it just feels like if you're not studying Team Liquid, you might as well not play the game. Whereas with the Mortal, it's like, well, they can scout it out and see if they're doing this thing, and they do this other thing. And then your, your thing is only going to be a minute delayed out, and then from there, it's going to actually... Like, you'll see where they are, you can choose the engagement better, and also you can see if things are changing, and change and change accordingly. Or you can kind of change things as well, and see is your opponent responding to what you're doing. There is more, as again, a sense that, like Zard said, there is an actual fight going on. <laughs> you know, I, I do agree. It does feel like you have a clearer state of improvement as well, because, you know, you see the teapot, you know exactly, oh, okay, mm -hmm. I didn't see it, that's why that happened. And, like, there yeah. was scouts in, like, in other games, but, yeah, I'm really happy they brought this to I mean, why not have it at this point? It's like, yeah, it's just going to oh, teach yeah. more moments. Like, yeah. Yeah, I, think, yeah. I think with this, I want to bring it to the next subject I wanted to talk about. Uh, it's really about introducing new players. Like, we're talking a bit about uh, how sometimes getting into a new player is a bit... Mm -hmm. It can be hard. It's much easier now, right? It's definitely easier than, yes. it, than it was in StarCraft. But of course, someone that's never played... That's never played any type of RTS game, that's never played... That's never played, like, a competitive game like this, it's going to be hard... And yeah, so what would be like the best way to bring them in? Then first off, uh, so like getting into the game, I will call that uh, meta. That's something that was discussed a bit on the, 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 the Parasite chat. So I want to just define what is meta exactly. So the meta being everything surrounding the game. Uh, Sar, do you have a good definition of meta? I think that if you consider... <coughs> Sorry. If you consider the word meta to almost be an acronym that stands for... It's not! Move... Sorry, that bothers, that bothers me. It's not. <laughs> going, I, know, I, know, keep... I know it's a mnemonic. Sorry. I don't okay, keep let me... Keep going, sorry. Ignore Dom. Most effective tactics available. Okay? Yeah. Then you can... 
Okay, and, and here's here's there's a bit of an argument for this. I I see you cringing at it. Okay, because it's not meta comes from the word Greek. It means something about actually well, mother of, but it means it eventually means something about a thing. It's a it. So a meta game is yeah. a game about a game. Well, that's another interpretation, right? There's that's more than one. Keep going, sorry. Keep going, sorry. <laughs> I mean, me meta is a back as uh, most of the fact available is a backronym, which does describe the fact that the meta game typically constitutes the complete set of all optimal strategies at any given time. Yeah, all optimal known strategies. At That's what I said at any given time. time. But yes, all optimal known strategies, a better way of phrasing that. Yeah. So so part so, of that is that a lot of players, when they come in, they, of course, don't know the meta at all. And then they have to learn part of the meta to be allowed to uh, to play the game, basically. Uh, Dom, you seem like you want to have something to say as well. <laughs> no, Santa Claus just saying, Dom may be correct, but Zarda's right. And I can't argue with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no okay Thomas Greg's art is right yeah uh, but yeah so meta in the context of new players just to bring it back to like the context of new players so meta in context of new players like that's what they need to learn because the game is there it's going to be the same for everyone uh, difference is just they don't know what they're supposed to do with the game which I think I yeah be. yeah <laughs> and then it's yeah. uh, I, uh, no. I mean it's I don't really agree because the thing with meta, like the meta game, broadly speaking, only really applies to the top level of play. If you're talking about mm. new players, it does not apply. That's true. Yeah. I mean, you can kind of talk about there being like smaller meta games within a more isolated community. Like if you have, if you introduced a mortal to a group of friends and they were just playing with each other, oh. they'd have their own meta game developed there, but. The good, old ladders, that, the good old ladders of the 2000s. Yeah, yeah. It's like when it comes to that, it's like, no, it's... Land the, parties. You're not using optimal strategies at that point, so the question of what the optimal strategies are isn't really relevant so much as just a question of what is currently working, which isn't so much a metagame as just game knowledge. Okay. So meta is not important to beginner players. It's really... It's God, really, no. God, no. God, no. God, no. Honestly, no. it's counterproductive. <laughs> like, I, I'm sorry. This is a personal thing for me. I, I My growth in competitive gaming and gaming just stuff in general learning in general was stunted by the fact that i started out with brood war by going to team liquid and learn looking up strategies i know i mentioned earlier felt like you had to but that really made it difficult for me to actually develop See? and same thing with fighting games and combos like i just had i got so caught up in trying to make sure that i was doing everything perfectly that i didn't understand that it really didn't matter at my skill level at that point see that's actually a point i want to bring up as well so i'm happy you did so the fact that when you're a new player, in general, I think it's not important to actually learn build orders and the likes, and uh, like like it it can be detrimental to learn that stuff because right. you don't know how the units work, and I know like sometime in teaching someone's like oh okay of course I'm gonna teach you a build order you can just copy it and that makes it rough and I think I I'm, I'm looking at Zara and I was like yeah that's often how you... I I've seen Zara to teach people but of course those are not complete beginners so it's not the same exactly right Zara. Ooh. So I think it's also just a it's a question of. Not only, like, I think it's a question of who you've ended up managing to play with, right? Because, like, as, as, uh, as Dominic was saying, like, you end up with small groups of people that are playing against each other and they develop their own kind of meta, right? Yeah. So, as a result, if you end up in a situation where a low-level player is playing against a high-level player, well, then the meta suddenly becomes very relevant, what the high level players have figured out becomes very relevant and then if they want to play at some level where they can compete with the high level player well then they have to learn a they have to learn a set of tactics right I think so, so as a result, like my whenever i'm teaching new players things i have to go okay well what what we have a larger community we have okay well i won't say larger community because the community of play testers is not all that big. There's 600 but pieces of keys. I want to be able to get over that barrier that allows them to play with the current community of playtesters, right? And that's where I think teaching someone a build order is useful, right? So that way they can kind of get off the ground and actually do something in the game. But at the same time, I think that also is a little bit stunting in terms of letting them explore the game, yeah. right? So I think mm -hmm. the main difference between 
me and Magical and some of the new players that have been coming into the game that we teach them a build order and things like that in order to get them off the ground is the fact that me and Magical sat around and went, I wonder how this works. Let's try it. And then we did that. And for 50 games. Awesome. <laughs> and then we and then we settled on something and we started making it efficient. And we settled on the thing yeah. that we, we yeah. thought was like. Yeah, so the, the meta in Immortal right now isn't so much the meta game as just how Zard and Magical play, and no one else has found a way to beat them independently yet. Yeah, basically. Yeah, because exactly. they've, they've looked at 52 different ways they could be and said, ah, now you can't beat it, so I guess that's what we're going to play now. And yeah, basically. Yeah, so we, we sat around, we went, how do you, how would, what are the different responses to this? Heck, we did that with openings specifically. Yeah. We sat around and went, there's this many openings. And I remember I got like, I got some channel somewhere that literally just has me listing out every of Ether, Expo, and Legion Hall. The <laughs> first three buildings yep. in Immortal. And I went, okay, well, which ones of these work? Which ones of these don't? Ends up being you should always expand first. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so then I made some hypotheses and then I went, okay, well, let's try testing these. So, I, so we started taking expand first. Why did we start with expand first? Because it turns out that people like macro games, right? And so we just sat there and compared a bunch of different openings to expand first and expand plus two ether. And it turns out that a lot, that a lot of the advantages that you got out of all the other builds just didn't match up with the adva with the advantage of having an extra base and 400 more resources worth of stuff. Everything else was trying to equalize economically using every other advantage that those builds got. And we found out that was really hard. So we decided to just play Expo first. Well, that makes sense, at least. Yeah, so, the amount of turrets and such. How, how easy it is to defend things, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, exactly. Right. The so, towers and everything, yeah. As a result, like... We just explored everything, and we figured out how and why things work, and now we have all that experience to pull off of for the future of, like, why things work versus didn't work. And that's where a new player doesn't really get that experience when you hand them a build order, but at the same time, it's really hard to get them to, to go and say, hey, just explore the game, right? Because they want to be able to play with the people who've already explored mm -hmm. Game. So you end up in this weird space of they both need to know what we currently know in order to like play a decent game, yeah, that and kind of yeah. it would be best for them if they didn't. Yeah, so, I so, mean, so, it's it's, it's more a matter of also teaching how to approach it because the yeah. question is if you're trying to approach it just like tell me how to win, it's like no. <laughs> but if it's approach is like tell me how to figure out how to win, then that's the way to go. Right. Because like, tell and me how to win like, is like, okay, so I'll get your build order, but then after, after you get messed up, you don't know what to do. But if you know the logic for it, then at least you can build that up and turn it into something. Right. Yeah, and I feel like as a result of like the exploring and everything that me and Magical have done, a lot of my games have just been me kind of freestyling on the macro thing, thinking... What do I want to do, and what are the requirements to do it? Okay, I do this, and we're good. And then I iterate on it a little bit, and I come up with an idea that works. Mm -hmm. that and sense. therefore, you have that. That's the process on setting the meta, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. You find the optimal stuff, mm -hmm. and then <clears throat> there's nothing that actually beats it, I guess. Oh, well, that can beat it well or be as optimized and. Yeah. Yeah, yeah right. although to be fair, we're at a very early and limited part of the ecosystem. Yeah, exactly. Like that, so missing that will everything. Change. Yeah, exactly. That like, will absolutely change. Yeah, because I'm just thinking, for example, if you have drops, depending how early drops come in, well, okay, then you have a really strong way to gain advantages over the opponent because you have complete map control thanks to drops, mm -hmm. and the person has to stay home to defend it, <laughs> and that's just gonna transform everything. Oh, so yeah, teching faster is gonna allow you to get map control in a much more prominent way, for example. Uh. But yeah, coming back to newcomers, so, so new players. So the thing with build orders is often the, the players we're describing right now are people that are at least somewhat experienced, right? Or would you try and teach someone <clears throat> that has no experience in RTS, in, in RDS or battle strategy at all? Would you try and teach them how to, like, would you show them a build order? Or how would you show them to explore the game itself? Because the game right uh, now, it's still a completely competitive state because we have no co-op or anything. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. I mean... 
this okay here's how i would teach it ideally you grab two noobs and you stick them together they play against each other often and then you give pointers for them to look at and try right that would be the ideal way to go about it the fact of the matter is is that we have a very coarse set of play testers and any new players end up playing against those that core set of play testers more often so like we need more new people to play against yeah but say right but the point is we want to keep those people and like what's the best way to introduce them to the game that's going to make them stay because the grind mindset of you have to get this border well or else you won't be able to join us is going to push a lot of people away right and so as a result like it's a question of volume versus letting them play yeah. in a satisfying manner right so if somebody is exploring the game while playing against me where my version of exploring the game is just going to naturally be more optimal than somebody else's because i have experience with how the systems manage together well then someone's going to end up with a less satisfying experience playing against me unless i give them the bill right yeah, well, even though i don't want to well like dom I mean, dom I... you came in like you came in like not as experienced in rts as a lot of other people for example or at least not in the starcraft uh, 2 context for not example. recently yeah exactly not in the starcraft 2 context at i haven't all. played star pedally in 12 years so yeah, yeah exactly so you don't come in and how like you learned you learned immortal from czar that gave you a build order and said this is how you're going to approach it how did you feel about playing that way or was that he didn't really do that though he gave me a bunch of he, he showed me the set of permutations yep. and went well, these are the options that we kind of have and i went all right started messing around with all of them and saw the kind of what set up for me i mean the thing with the mortal is that build orders aren't as big of a deal like True. when i'm talking like the thing that i really don't think immortal quite matches that because immortal build order is what five six buildings it's like when you're done this build that kind of thing whereas starcraft is like you know 10 15 minutes of building these things and we are this much supply when you're at 50 supply build this or 60 supply build this it's so much that you have to know across a bunch of different parts of the game like a bunch of different stages of the game in order to be able to even get to those stages immortally you can freestyle so much more yeah so sure. it didn't matter as much um, yeah on, on some regard i do agree with that on the other on the other side of it like if i want to give somebody something that is like someone wants to approach the game a certain way well then i'm gonna have to give them a five minute long build in order to get them to that point where they have the thing that they want to explore and play with right yeah and so yeah. i didn't do that with you specifically because i thought that handing you a build order and telling you to get it right would be really just a bad way to teach you specifically the game you're right <laughs> yep <laughs> i i i because i actually do like i said before that's a short-term game that's mm. right. get me really focused on trying to get that build order right and not focused at all on trying to make sure that i'm actually learning the game right yep learning learning one thing less so game. now because i'm more aware of it but historically mm -hmm. that's how it's gone yeah right it's like i want i wish i could teach every new player just in the way of like explore the game right yeah no, i don't know i think the way you told me it was like find units that you would like and then kind of well, just build those but the issue and is like if you need to... like there are different types of newcomers right your type of newcomer was you already do the game and all the units whereas i'd expect yeah. most newcomers True. like i'd expect most newcomers to know nothing and like if they've told starcraft oh yeah this is like a marine and that's about like what they know it's like okay that's cool mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah and, but there's also i mean this is where special look cool coming this is where once things get really ironed out and people and it's more than just placeholder models and programmer art yeah. that it'll be a lot easier to say hey this looks really cool i want to do that i want to do that. how do i make that and then they're hooked <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm really hoping for yeah that. <laughs> yeah that's true i also think like Oh, frick. Because well, the, the goal right now is when you have a newcomer, you want him to have fun and to keep playing. 
and yeah. like the grind mindset can work for some or the people that were already oh, yeah. experienced but for newer people it's like how do i find the fun for them oh, and yeah, make yeah. them come back for it yeah. but i think also part of the issue with that is that in this yeah. iteration of the game you won't have that because all we have is the competitive map like that's yeah. all we have. honestly I, yeah i mean to me yeah. if you don't have the two new players the way to do it and I, that's why i posted the article is literally just sandbags yeah you're, you're mm. being a sparring partner you're not trying to beat them you're trying to get them you're yeah, trying to give that. them some space to explore while providing some resistance that's right. appropriate to their level right, yeah, right, right, right. and then also doing voice chat i mean i'm speaking more from experience from really getting back into fighting games when guilty gear plus r got rollback netcode my experience was so much better when i had voice chat like when i was talking to people while playing and we were going over what i'm doing what i'm doing well what i need to work on that was very useful and very engaging okay. and i felt like i felt really good about doing it I, I was i never really felt frustrated while playing even though i was getting my ass kicked and by the time i actually started learning the game well all these people have gotten to know me and now they're like wow that's really really well done you've you've really gotten a lot better and so it makes me feel great because my progress has been acknowledged by another human being right so really i think that the voice chat community side of it is so the, social experience. so the social experience yeah, the social is really... experience is huge okay social is... Experience, being able to say like hey you're doing great yeah that like... that can mean a lot to someone yeah instead of saying you're doing bad hmm. yeah <laughs> like <laughs> we're not calling you out Zard. it's an example it kind of like leads into the whole mindset i think yeah. you're talking yeah, we like, can talk about mindset another time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. That's a whole can of worms, and I think I'll try and invite someone else for mindset. It's a very can. fun can of worms to talk about, though. Definitely. But yeah, so new players, I think, in general, what we said is the social experience is super important. And I think I pretty much agree with Dom about just be a punching bag, right? Don't attack. If you're going to attack, attack with one unit, which they can defend, right? You said, like, two units, yeah. they say, oh, okay, I'm going to kill them with these, and voila. Yeah. We'll say, like, there, there's another side to this where it's like, okay, well, when somebody says, don't try to win, right? I've often, I've found, I've made some attempts with this where I'm like, okay, so, and, and this is also something I'd like thoughts on. So, if you are not trying to win, let's say you're also trying, like, here's what, here's what I've tried. Like, I've tried to go, okay, what if I explored the game? right so then i go and attempt some things in order to explore the game and what i found was those things managed to win anyway no it's right. it was like i wasn't trying to win but and so therefore it becomes a question of like okay well yeah, i think it's like dom it? says you can't expect to explore stuff when you're the sandbag right once you're a sandbag the, your goal is to let the other person enjoy the game and discover it by his own yeah i think yeah. There's there's room for exploration if you're playing someone who's weaker than you but not total newbie. Like yeah. that's the one where I'd say if you're exploring. Like yeah. if if you're playing against me, then it makes sense to be exploring. Yeah. Because I can I, I can deal with that and it'll be a bit of a back and forth game. But someone who has no real experience, it doesn't matter what you do unless you just do less. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, yeah. You can't do anything. You just have to. Okay, he's doing that. Maybe I can do this and see how he reacts to it. He does it. Okay, I'll yeah. just pull back. Whatever. He like don't kill him like, about that yeah you your scouting alone is going to be so much better that you'll know exactly what they're doing so yeah. from there you can make judgment calls about what you can build that will be a fair fight yeah so and make them feel like it's engaging yeah so don't put dervish like, in other alloy lines basically of course not yeah i don't do that i kind of just i was kind of just like doing a death ball but then like your death ball is big no. And yeah, like, that's what I mean. You gotta make less. You have to like make yeah, it. Like, you have to make, make less. But the, the other side of this is that you're like, okay, well, what happens if you set a low expectations for a new player in terms of, oh, well, they're just gonna have this much at this time, right? That's why you scout them. Yeah, like, <laughs> you have scouts. Scouting yeah. them. You can scout with your Sipar, you can scout with your Scepters, and just don't attack them. You yeah. scout, go into base, and then... bring your Scepter, and go out. And you see exactly yeah. where they're at. Well, well, well that's the, this, is the, this is the thing where you go, okay, the, they... Where... How do I put it? If a new player engages in with non-optimal play, well, then they'll get expectations that 
will get upended later, right? That'll happen anyway. If two new players fight each other, they're going to be playing suboptimally. They're going to be messing around. And, and like, they're yeah. eventually going to learn that some of that works and some of that doesn't. But the important thing is that they're still getting to understand the broader system mechanics of the game. And then when they start learning, oh, this is what's this wor this works better or these this works in more situations they've still gotten into the game yeah like they have to try it out on their own like if you sure. just spoon fed everything you won't learn like you can't get yeah. spoon fed and learn you you're going to replicate what you got spoon fed but right yeah, yeah I guess. learning it's really it's not a matter of winning or losing it's a matter of feeling like you got to do something you sure. can have fun if you're losing as long as you felt like you had some agency in the process. Yeah. And okay. like that was a big thing Immortal brought in as well, right? Like you have agency when you lose against Infernal because at least you made units instead of dying to their first Reaper. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair enough. Yep. Yeah. Well, on that note, I think we're pretty much close to the end of the episode. We're getting at the one hour mark and I'd prefer to keep it one hour. I think we've discussed some nice things about I think I think the biggest takeaway is make it a social experience. You see someone you offer to go in voice chat. I think that would be the best experience for them. And then you can just discuss what they want to do. And that way you'll know exactly if they're new. That's that's how you know. You just uh, go in voice yep. chat with them. If you don't know yeah. your name, you don't know Yeah, them. it's how you, you just ask. I mean, Santa, really just ask them. If you haven't seen them around, just ask them. They might be an old hat that hasn't been here for a year. Yeah, they might be someone who just got in for a raffle. Yeah, you see like this guy called Hydra come in. Like, oh, I haven't seen you in like forever. He must be new. And... <laughs> <laughs> You must be totally new. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Uh, but yeah, on that note, I think we'll end it here. Oh, I'll just cast my background again. Okay, on that note, we're going to end it here. Uh, I'm ZK. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at ZK012. Uh, me is Dom. You can find me at Dominic Cast on Twitter. And Zard at Zardasil on Twitter. Uh, and Dom, you can also find his videos at Shadow Fury Free Free Free. Correct. Yes, I got it. On YouTube? On YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't have 100 subscribers yet, so I can't actually change my name. So I'm HB0. Oh, I just got grandfathered in. Oh, damn. I've had the YouTube channel since 2010. Nice. Yeah. Still waiting for that. Well, in any case, thanks everyone for watching. This was Playing with Pyre Episode 003. Uh, we'll be back next week where we'll talk about hopefully the new patch, or else I guess we can go to the can of worms we opened earlier. That. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night.